How do employers make their money? Where do profits come from? How can these profits be maximised? Today we're going to dive into Karl Marx's Law of Value to unveil the answers to these burning questions of our time and more. Get the notepads out and let's go. Welcome to Socialism 101, a series designed to help educate people with no prior knowledge on the basics of socialism and communism from an ML and MLM perspective with short and easily digestible videos. Well, at least they're usually pretty short. If this sounds interesting to you, then go ahead and hit subscribe and turn on the notification bell below. If you'd like to support Marxist educational content and you're in a position to do so, then toss a euro or a dollar per month over on Patreon to help keep this series going. Marx begins Capital Volume 1 by stating that the wealth of those societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails presents itself as an immense accumulation of commodities, its unit being a single commodity. Our investigation must therefore begin with the analysis of a commodity. So what is a commodity? At its most basic level, a commodity is a product that is created for exchange in order to make money. Take for example a chair that is bought and sold in a shop. That chair will be purchased by a consumer for their own personal use from a capitalist who seeks to realise a profit from the exchange. As suggested from this, commodities like our chair contain both use value and exchange value within them. A commodity's use value is simply that which it is useful for. Our chair is used for sitting on, for comfort, and maybe for aesthetic purposes if it's a particularly handsome chair, which it is. A commodity's exchange value is that ratio at which it is exchanged for something else. For example, one chair could be exchanged for 20 hats or 60 kilograms of rice. Of course, it's not very practical to carry around 20 hats or 60 kilograms of rice, and the seller of the chair may not even need them. So instead, we use money as the universal equivalent. So our chair could instead be exchanged for 100 euros. It's a very, very handsome chair. This price of 100 euro then represents the exchange value of the chair. But what determines the ratio at which different commodities are exchanged? Why is one handsome chair equivalent to 20 hats or 100 euro? Exchange value is determined by a product's value, which is determined by the socially necessary labour time required to produce it. So the price that you see in a shop is not the product's actual value in and of itself, but rather, assuming supply and demand are in equilibrium, an estimate of the product's value, which is, again, determined by the socially necessary labour time that has been required to produce it. The chair's price of 100 euro is an estimate of how much socially necessary labour time has gone into its production. So to quickly reiterate, there's use value, exchange value and value. Use value is a product's usefulness. Exchange value is the ratio at which one commodity can be exchanged for another, usually represented by the universal equivalent of the money commodity. Value is the socially necessary labour time required to create the product. Our chair's use value is that it can be sat upon and enjoyed for its handsomeness. Our chair's exchange value is equivalent to 100 euros. Our chair's value is the socially necessary labour time that it took to produce, let's say 4 hours. So for Marx, value isn't just some subjective phenomenon, but rather objectively determined by labour, hence the labour theory of value or LTV. But Marx wasn't the first person to theorise the labour theory of value. Liberal political economists like Adam Smith and David Ricardo also employed versions of the labour theory of value long before Marx. However, it was Marx who was able to clarify that it isn't just any old form of labour that creates value, but rather socially necessary labour. That is, labour that meets the wants and needs of society in one way or another. Labour that produces use value. Four hours spent working on the creation of our handsome chair is useful, it creates value. Four hours spent running around a city hammering random rocks, while certainly difficult and even laborious, isn't producing anything of use for anyone, so it's not socially necessary labour and does not produce value. Furthermore, our chair isn't going to be twice as valuable if I decide to work slowly and it takes me double the amount of time to complete, nor half as valuable if I work at double speed. Socially necessary labour time is determined by the average amount of labour required in average conditions with average tools to produce. For one person, they may be able to produce the chair in three hours. For another, it may take five hours. The socially necessary labour time then, in this case, would be the average between them, four hours. Of course, with technological development and automation, with the development of productive forces, the socially necessary labour time decreases, and with it, the value of the product and the capitalist's potential for realising profit also decreases. Which, as you can imagine if you think of this tendency of the rate of profit to fall on a societal scale, has troubling implications for the capitalist ruling class. 
A chair that once required four hours of socially necessary labour may now be produced in one hour with the aid of machines, so its exchange value represented in price is forced to represent its new lower value. Meaning the use value of the commodity remains the same, but the exchange value decreases, and subsequently less profits can be derived from the same commodity. But let's put the magnitude of profits aside for now. How is it that capitalists end up with these profits in the first place? Where exactly did they come from? One of Marx's most important contributions to the labour theory of value, to this Marxist law of value more broadly, is his analysis of surplus value and the exploitation of labour. In order to understand where capitalists' profits come from, we need to understand wage labour. Capitalism relies on the proletariat selling its capacity to labour to the capitalist for fixed periods of time, whether that's an hourly wage or an annual salary. The important point is that workers don't sell their labour directly, but rather they sell their ability to do labour for a given period of time. That is, workers sell their labour power through this system of wage labour. And this selling of labour power, the capacity to do work over a period of time, rather than labour itself, facilitates the extraction of surplus value from workers hidden within the production process. The end result is that, while a worker may get paid for working for four hours, the worker is not getting paid the full value of that four hours work. And in fact, the only reason that the worker has been hired to do this wage labour is because the capitalist knows that the worker is going to produce more value than the capitalist is going to pay for it. Let's take a look at the general formula of capital to see this in action. The capitalist starts off with money, M, then he purchases commodities, C, then he sells commodities and ends up with more money than he initially spent, M prime, the added value being represented by the prime. Now, value is not created by circulation, by simply trading back and forth, but rather, value is created by socially necessary labour. So therefore, if the capitalist wants to make a profit, then the value producing commodity he has to purchase will be labour power. So the capitalist purchases this commodity, then sells the product of this labour power to realise the profit. The capitalist can then use that profit to purchase more commodities to realise greater profits and so on into infinity. But this MCM circuit is perhaps a little bit simplistic and doesn't fully reveal where the profit comes from, instead just showing us that it exists by the end. So let's look at the expanded form of the general formula of capital to pinpoint it exactly. Our capitalist friend starts with money, M. With this money he's going to purchase two things, that is, two types of commodities. Labour power, LP, in the form of wage labour based on hourly, daily, weekly or monthly wages, which is referred to as variable capital, and means of production, MOP, the tools needed for production, the factory, as well as the raw materials necessary for said production. Importantly, these contain a certain amount of dead labour congealed within them due to the previous labour that was necessary to produce them, like cutting down the trees for wood, like the manufacturing of the tools, and so on. And this value will be passed on to the final product, which is why we also refer to this as constant capital, though this doesn't create new value like variable capital does. So, our capitalist friend has purchased these commodities, labour power and the means of production, and now we proceed to the actual production process, P, through which living labour creates new value. The result of this production is that a new commodity has been created, C prime, which contains value over and above the value that had been spent on the earlier commodities of labour power and means of production. That is, surplus value has now suddenly appeared. And this surplus value is realised in profit when the capitalist takes that new commodity to the market and sells it for a sum of money greater than what they paid initially for labour power and means of production, M prime. Let's run through that again using our handsome chair to demonstrate. Our capitalist starts off with 60 euro. He uses 20 euro to purchase the wood, the hammer, the nails, etc. necessary for this chair, the means of production. He uses the remaining 40 euro to purchase four hours of labour power from a worker. The worker then gets to work on the creation of this chair in the production process. And the final result of that is a finished handsome chair imbued with value over and above that which was spent on the labour power and the means of production. So now the capitalist can take this new chair to the market and, assuming supply and demand are in equilibrium, sell it for 100 euro to realise a profit of 40 euro over and above the initial sum of money spent. But how can this be? Well, we know that 20 euro was transferred into it through the dead labour imbued within the raw materials and tools used for its production, the constant capital. But this means that 80 euro has been generated from living labour in the production process, the variable capital. 40 euro of this was paid to the worker for 4 hours of their labour power. But this leaves a further 40 euro remaining as a surplus. 
So while the worker worked for 4 hours and was paid 40 euro for working for 4 hours, the worker actually produced value translating to 80 euro over that period. The worker was only compensated for half the value of their labour and the capitalist made off with the rest. The 40 euro profit that the capitalist realised is the unpaid labour of the worker. The value of the labour was realised as 80 euro while the worker only received 40 euro as payment for their labour power. The capitalist paid 40 euro for something that was worth double that. The labour power was then purchased at a lower cost than the labour itself produced within that period of time. So now we see how while the worker was paid for working for 4 hours, they were not paid for 4 hours work. And this wouldn't be a unique situation. The entire capitalist system is premised on capitalists appropriating the unpaid labour of the proletariat through wage labour and this purchasing of labour power which enables the hidden exploitation of labour. Only half of the time spent working in this situation was actually necessary labour, that is, labour necessary to cover the costs of the worker's wage. The other half was surplus labour, labour that produced surplus value which was then appropriated by the capitalists. Two hours of necessary labour and two hours of surplus labour. For every hour that was worked, only half of that hour was necessary to cover the 10 euro paid in hourly wages, while a further half hour was worked for free, and the capitalist pocketed the value generated by it. If this surplus labour hadn't taken place, then the commodity that resulted from the production process wouldn't have any surplus value imbued within it, meaning the capitalist wouldn't be able to realise a profit and would instead just break even. Exploitation, this appropriation of the proletariat's unpaid labour, is a necessary condition for capitalism. And there are different levels of exploitation that may occur. The rate of exploitation can be measured by S over V, or the surplus value over the variable capital. Here the surplus value is manifested in the profit of 40 euro, while the variable capital is the amount spent on wages, which is also 40 euro. So that'd be 40 over 40, meaning a rate of exploitation of 100%. If the profit was 20 euro, it'd be 20 over 40 and the rate of exploitation would be 50%. If the profit was 80 euro, then the rate of exploitation would be 200%. Again, always assuming supply and demand are in equilibrium. And a higher rate of exploitation is precisely what capitalists continually strive for, leading to higher profit margins for them. Not due to any malice, ill intent or moral failures on their behalf, but simply because the system of capitalism necessitates it in order to perpetuate itself. So how might they do that? How do capitalists maximise surplus value? Let's recall that time spent labouring is divided into two sections. Necessary labour, which covers the cost of wages, and surplus labour, which generates value above and beyond that paid to the worker. It's in the interest of the capitalist's profits to make it so that there's as little necessary labour as possible, and as much surplus labour as possible. The first way they can do this, and have done this historically, is by augmenting the length of the working day. This increases what's called absolute surplus value. However, as a result of organised labour action, many countries now have limits to the number of hours a person can work a particular job, generally about 40 hours a week. This means that, aside from snatching a few extra minutes here and there before or after work or during the lunch break, absolute surplus value is no longer the most viable route for maximising surplus value. Instead, capitalists turn to increasing what's called relative surplus value. This means keeping the overall number of hours worked as they are, but instead simply maximising the surplus labour within that time period by decreasing the necessary labour. And you'll know this very well yourself through the modern obsession with endlessly increasing worker productivity while real wages remain stagnant. So you work harder and generate more value, but capitalists pay you the same hourly rate, at least in terms of real wages. Where does the added surplus value from this increased productivity go? Straight into the pocket of the capitalist. Aside from the intensification of labour, another way of maximising relative surplus value is for capitalists to lower the cost of labour power. Capitalists need to pay the minimum wage of subsistence for labour to be able to reproduce itself. You can't work if you haven't got enough money to pay for life's necessities like shelter, food, water, clothing, etc. So the amount covering those bare necessities will be the lower limit in this regard. But if the capitalists can lower the cost of life's necessities, then they can get away with paying lower wages, which will reduce the necessary labour and increase surplus labour. There are other ways that a capitalist might attempt to increase relative surplus value, and we see this playing out for example in the gig economy and with zero hour contracts. But the main ways that relative surplus value will be increased generally comes down to either intensification of labour or reducing the cost of labour by various ways and means. Today we've taken a look at the Marxist law of value. 
We began by looking at commodities, their use value, what they're useful for, exchange value, the proportion at which they can be exchanged for other commodities, usually represented by the universal equivalent of money, and the determining factor of their overall value, socially necessary labour time. We then proceeded to look at Marx's law of value as distinguished from other versions of the labour theory of value and the importance of understanding that it's only socially necessary labour that produces value. We then moved on to analysing wage labour and the process by which a capitalist purchases labour power rather than labour directly and how this conceals the capitalist's appropriation of the worker's unpaid labour. We pinpointed the location in the process of production at which this occurs by looking at the expanded general formula of capital to reveal the point at which necessary labour and surplus labour take place, bringing to light the capitalist's exploitation of the worker. We also demonstrated how this exploitation can even be measured, surplus value over variable capital, so that we can see in plain sight the rate of exploitation occurring. Lastly, we proceeded to look at how the capitalist seeks to maximise this exploitation by increasing absolute surplus value through longer working hours and increasing relative surplus value by intensifying labour and reducing its cost. This is the Marxist law of value. However, we've only really begun to scratch the surface of it. To get a thorough understanding of Marx's law of value and all of its components, you'll need to dive into the reading yourself. There's a full reading list on this topic in the description box below, including various other sources like podcasts and some great YouTube videos to help supplement your study. Hopefully this video will make things a little bit easier for you as you're working through that reading. Thanks very much to the supporters on Patreon who've made this video possible. Thank you Ian McShay, Hugh Gopnik, Annex Magnus, Borku Gorilla, Ryan Hodgson, Soup, Madeline, Sonic232, Sagan, Michaela Schmid, Christian Napalis, Brian Roos, Alfonso Dingo Torres, Mekalova, Keith to the Fields, Rock Artist, Zakasi, Anglo Irish Bolshevik, Todd Sprang, Nike Desaid, Train H13, Miosifer, Hunter Johnson, Rare Hero, Don Loquishleva, Sixney Vielen, Kale Marx, Roja, MLM in Practice, Eric Lindahl, ZK Goody, Laverna Wintermore, Coil Rap, Vuchko, Doc Toma, Iob Farah, Becky, Pastor Schubert, A Mouthwash Bottle, Mr. Miyamoto, Coil King, Reverend Lon Gnome Hollywood, Wonderbad, JT Chapman, Jose, Joseph Shepard, Jack Schneidman, Comrade Amara, Wealth for the 99%, Spoop, and Trailer Park Communist. Cheers everyone, August Longafoe.